Thank you, Steve, uh, and thank you for inviting me to come to Moss. I've never been here, and uh, I've read a lot of work that comes out of this great place, and uh, so I'm very, very excited to be here, and I've had some really stimulating discussions uh, so far. So what I decided to do, instead of uh, talking about these large-scale trials uh, and focusing primarily on the clinical outcomes, I decided I'd put a talk together talk about some of the exciting things that uh, we have been doing uh, in the area of mechanisms, and particularly as they relate to learning and memory processes, which are rarely considered or examined in clinical populations that participate in these kinds of trials. So I'm going to cover uh, four different projects that uh, uh, most, mostly my graduate students have uh, taken on. Uh, and share with you some, uh, some uh, results that uh, we think have tremendous clinical implications. The first uh, relates to this issue of contextual interference. The second is looking very closely at practice structure. The third is uh, the mirror neuron system in stroke, in the stroke brain. And the fourth one has to do with limb choice, which is something I've gotten very interested in uh, based on the EXCITE trial and uh, some issues related to learn non-use. So my laboratory uh, is really multifaceted. Uh, we do small-scale studies, uh, but we also do large-scale studies. And I'm focusing now here on the small-scale studies that really focus on mechanism. Uh, the two areas that we, the two approaches that we take, really three different approaches, uh, are common in that we want to understand the optimal strategies for enhanced motor skill learning, particularly when a part of the brain is damaged from disease or injury. So this area has a very strong scientific basis, particularly within the last 15 years, related to neuroplasticity and the capability of the adult brain to uh, reorganize itself when triggered by experience. But what we're trying to understand in the context of neurorehabilitation, which is really a complex medical, cognitive, and psychological uh, phenomenon, is what are the critical ingredients that stimulate these positive neuroplastic changes? And there's less that we know about that. And that's really, I think, where the important mechanistic work comes in. And this is an accident. Uh, I you know, didn't realize I was coming to Einstein, but uh, I had this uh, slide in here uh, to begin with. One of the things that we have learned from a lot of the, uh, the clinical trials that have been done uh, that makes us think that we need to train the brain and the body, not just the body, but we're also training the brain. And it's really understanding how we're training the brain that, uh, that we need to, uh, to focus on, I think, uh, a little more closely and understand the mechanisms. So I'm going to talk about uh, s s just the tip of the iceberg of what we understand uh, in, in these four different studies. So the first one has to do with mechanisms of the contextual interference effect in individuals post-stroke. And this is a recent paper that we published in J Neurophys uh, last year. So this work is completed. Uh, all of this, these things, the work is completed, but only in the first two uh, do we actually have published data. So I'm telling you in some sense things for the last two that are not published and are in process. So they're more hot off the press. So this issue of uh, the contextual interference effect has been shown in healthy uh, individuals for quite some time. And that is that if you practice in a random schedule, you tend to enhance uh, uh, retention of the skill better than if you practice in a, in a blocked uh, or constant uh, schedule of, of tasks. So if you have three things to learn, if you order them in random order, you actually, while it's more difficult during practice, to, uh, to perform these, there's a payoff uh, in retention a day later, a month later, such that you build up better retention for these skills and better transfer. This has been difficult to demonstrate in the stroke population. And there are a few studies that have 
uh, study the contextual interference effect in individuals with stroke, and they have mixed results. And so the question we were asking here was, why in some cases do we see an effect of contextual interference on retention of motor skills, but in others we don't? What is it about the stroke brain? And uh, I did this work in collaboration with uh, my colleague, Nicholas Schweighofer, who's a computational neuroscientist, and he plays with models of learning. And he had the idea of uh, using this common, fast, and distinct slow memory process model to, under to one, simulate uh, the findings of contextual interference, and secondly, to explain uh, data that, uh, that we actually acquired uh, in the individuals with stroke. So let me tell you briefly about the study. So there were two groups, two skill level groups, uh, one uh, stroke and the other uh, basically young controls. We had two practice conditions, blocked versus random, and the task that the subjects had to learn was an isometric grip task that had a spatial temporal pattern that looked like this but there were three different patterns, as you can see here. One group practiced these three different patterns in random order, and the other group practiced them in blocked order. So they did a block of the same task, and then they switched to a new version, and then they switched to a new version. So the only difference between them, they all got the same number of trials, was the, whether or not they practiced in uh, random or blocked order. The participant, uh, basically, the issue was they got a they got a screen that looked like this. It said ready. Then they applied the force uh, with their paretic limb uh, on the handle. And then they got feedback that looked like this, which was their actual force profile against the target force pattern. And they got an error score. And their goal was to basically reduce the error as much as possible. And uh, so our rationale was that the previous findings had been inconclusive. Uh, with respect to demonstrating the contextual interference effect. Um, individuals with, with uh, unilateral stroke-related damage often exhibit deficits in visual-spatial working memory. We had seen this in a much earlier study that we had done. Um, and so accordingly, the integrity of visual-spatial working memory may play a role in the CI effect in individuals post-stroke. The reason why we argued that is that Visual spatial working memory is sort of a short-term, fast memory process. So it's, it's sort of memory storage. And we argued that this might give us a window into the fast process. So we acquired uh, visual spatial working memory uh, using the uh, figural memory test from the Wexler. The purpose was to test our previous model, and this was a uh, one fast, multiple slow process model that my colleague Nicholas Schweighofer had published in 2009 in predicting the role of visual spatial working memory in modulating the CI effect. So in other words, does someone's intactness of this fast memory process uh, modulate the benefit that you would see from random practice or block practice? And uh, so we wanted to, to test this, whether it modulated the CI effect, and to test the CI effect also in individuals post-stroke with this visual spatial working memory deficit. So we argued that if they, they had this deficit, they would show this uh, effect, and that we would be able to, to weed it out by uh, parceling out the fast and slow memory processes. And that would then provide some behavioral support for the model. So our hypothesis was that visual spatial working memory will be shown to modulate the CI effect behaviorally and through the computational model. So let me take you through the results. These are the control subjects. This is a normalized uh, 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 performance score with high being better. These are the blocked subjects. These are the random subjects. And you see the typical in the block, you see a very rapid rise in performance, and then they stabilize. And there's also very little, there's less variability uh, between subjects than you see in the random uh, trajectory, where the rise is a lot slower, and the variability is, uh, is higher, and they don't reach asymptote as early as the blocked group. 
What's of interest here is the replication of the contextual interference effect. Now here you're looking at, in some sense, forgetting. So in the blocked group, on an immediate retention test, they perform relatively well. But on a delayed retention test, which is what you're interested in, they lose quite a bit. So there's quite a bit of memory loss and forgetting. Uh, in the random group, however, you can see that there's very little forgetting. Their performance in the immediate looks very similar to the delayed, showing essentially the contextual interference effect. The random practice is better for retention uh, on a delayed retention test. Now, if we look at our stroke group, we have a similar profile here uh, to the control groups. We have a, a more rapid rise than we do in the blocked group. We obviously have more variability. Uh, asymptote is reached a little sooner in the blocked group, um, not quite as soon in the random group. But they don't look quite as different as they do in the controls. What is of interest here, though, is if you look at the blocked groups, immediate and delayed, they show less forgetting than the control group. So they're actually uh, benefiting from blocked order practice more than our control group. And they show the same benefit for random practice. They show almost no decay. So this was a little puzzling to us. So when we simulated uh, our, our model simulations and we said, OK, um, we're going to plot on the, uh, the y-axis the forgetting contributed by the fast memory process. And remember, the fast memory process is what we think is updating uh, during blocked practice. So we've got these two memory processes that are actually competing with each other. During block practice, the fast is really doing most of the work. The slow isn't doing very much. During random practice, the slow memory process is being updated by the fact that you're randomly interleaving uh, these tasks. So here we're modeling, really, the fast process. And we're showing that in blocked, the time constant of the model, which relates to uh, the, slow, the fast memory process, is correlated uh, relatively highly with this forgetting. Whereas in random, we have almost no correlation. What was particularly interesting was then, when we used our Wexler figural memory test here on the left, and we use that as, uh, to compare to the forgetting in the blocked group, which is this difference here between immediate and delayed. We see that the people with the most impaired short-term figural memory showed the least forgetting. So they were benefiting pretty well from this blocked practice. But the people that had the least impairment in this uh, figural memory test actually um, showed much more forgetting. And this plot is very similar to here. In our random group, we had a couple outliers, and that's why you see these two, uh, these two graphs. But no matter how you look at it, with or without the outliers, you still don't see a relationship between the Wexler scores and the forgetting in the random. So. The bottom line of this uh, story is we in halfway confirmed our hypothesis that the integrity of visual spatial working memory modulates the contextual interference practice effect, but only in the block for the blocked condition. So we used experimental and a computational approach together. Together, those two uh, findings suggest that the CI effect is due at least in part to greater forgetting in visual spatial working memory between trials of the same task during random schedule practice than during block schedule practice. So the point of that is that the random schedule is relying uh, not on this fast process, but on this slow process. We found that the integrity of visual spatial working memory modulated the amount of forgetting after blocked practice in participants post-stroke. And as a result, only participants with good visual spatial working memory exhibited the CI effect. We think that this explains, then, the divergent findings in previous studies where they haven't really had a measure of short-term uh, memory. So it, it, the sort of 
extension of this would be to say that we might be able to select people that would benefit from random order practice, or from blocked order practice for that matter, by having a measure of their visual spatial short-term memory, which is not part of the battery of things that we use uh, in the clinic. Do you want questions now, or do we? However you want to handle it is fine. I have 39 slides, and I have uh, till 1 o'clock. <laughs> now that I've interrupted, I'll keep going. Go, please. Um, to me, if you could want to go back, can you go back to the slide with the immediate and delayed recall in the two groups? It, it actually looks like uh, not that it's not a retention effect. It looks like a save effect on savings. Right. Because that's another way to. That's sort of the flip side of. Yeah. Of, uh, it looks like the delayed recall is really quite comparable. The actual absolute value, of, you know, the absolute level of delayed recall. <laughs> For, for blocked versus random, it looks pretty. It looks pretty comparable. If you just look at the delayed right. recall, it looks like the retention is pretty similar, and you know it's just that the blocked practice has a boost in immediate. That's right. That's right. And that has to do with this short-term memory process. So people rely on the fact that they've just generated this solution, and then they generate it again, and that boosts performance. But it doesn't have in this paradigm anyway, it doesn't have any long-term effect on retention. Correct. And that's really the, the crux of the contextual interference effect. You know, the idea being that, you know, we can make people look good during block practice, but it's not really doing much. What we've shown here is that it can do, you know, something in, in an individual with stroke, particularly if they have an impairment in their short-term working memory because then it doesn't compete with the slow process. Do you know that they have to be learning other tasks during these, uh, or if you just uh, intersperse it with breaks, for instance, do you see this? It's a great question, and this is something we're, we're actually pursuing right now. So the issue is, there is there a spacing effect, <coughs> and does that spacing effect? And, and some of the models in fast and slow memory processes do rely more heavily on the spacing effect. But we do know that there's sort of, you know, there is interference when you practice another task as opposed to just having an empty space. However, we now know that space is not empty. And again, you probably don't know this answer either, but do you know, like with the contextual interference task, you actually chose a, a somewhat related task. If you do something entirely different that maybe occupies this, this working memory, could you like, a, a, I don't know, a motor, or even like a cognitive task? Something like that. Would that have a similar effect? Do you think? I would think so. Yeah. Because you're, you know, you're not able to use what's in working memory to generate this task. Mm -hmm. And if you notice the the force task we used, it was not the same pattern, just parameterized. It was actually a different pattern. Mm -hmm. So they really, you know, they could only benefit if they had just practiced that. You know, they if if the, if the other pattern was before it they wouldn't be able to really be benefit that much. They would have to rely on their memory of having practiced this previous task, which relies much more on the, long, on the, sh on the slow memory process. Mm -hmm. So you can think about it that we're building these two memories mm -hmm. during performance, and the fast one decays very quickly. So it's useful in the short term in block practice, but it's not very useful in random practice. Okay, so the, the next uh, thing I wanted to talk about has to do with learning and has to do with this offline processing, which I hinted at in the contextual interference effect because we're looking at delayed retention, which is after practice, and we're trying to understand what enhances that. And so uh, my former student and I just published this paper in uh, Behavioral and Brain Sciences arguing that this, was a, this is a very primitive model, but arguing that when we think about motor learning studies with this acquisition phase and immediate uh, retention test and a delayed retention or transfer test, that really we're accessing different parts of the encoding and memory process. So we can think about the acquisition phase as the encoding phase when we're practicing and we're trying to encode the memory representation of the skill that we're learning. Whereas the retention test is really when this consolidation 
uh, is going on. And we know that cons from other work that consolidation happens sort of right after practice. And it happens for a short amount of time. And the system is consolidating. And there is some work to suggest that, you know, if you, uh, that sleep enhances consolidation, that uh, the consumption of alcohol interferes with consolidation, uh, certain other kinds of things interfere with consolidation, and other things enhance it. So the point is that there is a lot of offline processing that's going on in particular uh, areas, particularly cortical areas, that uh, are happening independent of practice. Well, I shouldn't say independent, but that, are, that don't require you to physically be doing the action. Uh, so we think that the consolidation is, is, uh, is something that's occurring uh, sort of here, and that when we do delayed retention, we are really uh, looking at the retrieval capability of the actions that have been consolidated during the consolidation phase. So as a result of this model, um, Shalish said, what happens if we interfere with the consolidation phase? Because uh, his argument was that these uh, practice paradigms are probably having their effect on consolidation, and that's what's manifesting itself in the retention phase. So we used a paradigm similar to random blocked, only uh, coming more from uh, schema theory, which is constant practice versus variable practice. So here, the tasks are uh, they're similar, but they're changed on one dimension. So the structure of the task is similar, but they are different uh, by a uh, particular parameter. And uh, he wanted to investigate the manner in which offline neural networks are modulated by practice structures that affect motor skill retention. So he used TMS. And uh, the paradigm, basically, we had control subjects that would practice uh, a visual, spatial, temporal uh, lever task uh, under constant practice conditions. And then we uh, tested them. Uh, we looked at their end of acquisition performance. Uh, and then we brought them back uh, 24 hours later, and they did a retention test. We did the same sort of thing here uh, with um, a variable practice group. And uh, everything was exactly the same, only this group practiced under variable practice conditions. So this was a no TMS group. This is just a standard replication of what has been done in the literature. Then he had uh, a group where he interfered with uh, primary motor cortex for the task. So the muscle that was, uh, that was perturbed was the biceps, because the task was this. And so we figured that the representation of the biceps was, was a task-related uh, uh, interference. And he applied. 1 hertz RTMS to M1 at the end of acquisition. So when we think the consolidation process is, is beginning. And then brought these people back um, 24 hours later, and they did a retention test. Did exactly the same thing to the variable practice group. Uh, and he me measured um, the <clears throat> evoked potential uh, before applying RTMS and after applying RTMS to verify the fact that he had downregulated M1. The third group was exactly the same, except the target area was the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which has a lot to do with uh, selection of action, decision, and planning. And we felt that this was a critical uh, area um, uh, that might be uh, modulated, particularly by the variable practice condition, where you're varying the task. Did the exact same thing. Now, the one issue with DLPFC is that you can't verify that you're down-regulating because there's no evoked response when you stimulate in dorsolateral prefrontal. But he used the uh, individual's own MRI scan to anatomically select the position of the coil uh, on uh, the anatomically correct position for dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So let me show you what he found. Um, 
there were two other conditions, which I'm going to tell you about, but I don't want you to concentrate on too much right now. And that was he brought in uh, another group of subjects, and he delivered the RTMS to dorsolateral prefrontal cortex or to M1. He had two different groups. Four hours later, so he didn't deliver it right at the end of acquisition. He delivered it four hours later to kind of define this consolidation period with the argument that if he delivered it four hours later, he wouldn't see any interference because uh, consolidation would be essentially over by then. Uh, so here we have the variable practice group. And if you look at the control group, and you look at end of acquisition and retention, mind you, the uh, perturbation is occurring right here. In the control group, there's no perturbation. And you can see that they show this, uh, this benefit. Their performance on retention is pretty much as good as it was at the end of acquisition. Um, the uh, group that had the uh, interference to M1 also doesn't change very much. But the group that had uh, RTMS, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, shows uh, very large attenuation of uh, learning uh, at the retention test, uh, as shown here. And the four-hour group to the same uh, area shows really no statistically significant difference here. So it was clearly the immediately after acquisition, and it was clearly not M1. It was dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Interestingly enough, uh, what he found for the constant practice group was that here's the control group with the open circles. As he saw the classic uh, forgetting in retention from constant practice. But when he applied RTMS to M1, he got an enhanced forgetting effect, showing that M1 seems to mediate this uh, uh, process in variable practice. Um, in, for dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, uh, they looked very similar to the control group. It had really basically no effect. And the four-hour group uh, fit sort of here. So essentially what he found was that interference to dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but not to primary motor cortex after variable practice, attenuated motor learning, whereas interference to M1, but not DLPFC after constant practice attenuated motor skill learning. So the idea here is that there are different neural substrates that mediate what we think are the, uh, the effects of these different practice regimens, and that uh, this is particularly relevant for the consolidation phase. OK, now I'm going to move to the third uh, area, which, uh, which you might be interested in. Uh, and this is this whole idea of action observation, the mirror neuron system, and the fact that there have now been uh, a few uh, trials using action observation to enhance motor learning in people with stroke. Now, these trials have been done without really understanding the mechanism or even how the stroke brain responds to action observation. And so uh, my graduate student, Katie Garrison, uh, and my colleague, uh, Lisa Aziz Aday, uh, this was actually part of Katie's uh, dissertation, wanted to basically study this phenomenon in the stroke brain to establish a foundation for uh, this work uh, for, uh, for application. So what she did was she first people practiced uh, uh, in a mock scanner. And basically what they did in the scanner was simply observe uh, four different actions performed by an actor who was normal. And the actor, you can see the, it's the image that the actor, so the image the subject has is from uh, an outside perspective of the actor performing uh, lifting a pencil, lifting a paper clip, stacking checkers, and flipping cards. And those of you that know the Wolf Motor Function Test see that we've selected these from that battery of tests. The uh, individual with stroke uh, had, uh, had uh, four, uh, three blocks of this, 
observation learning where they would watch um, a, uh, a person performing with the left hand, performing with the right hand, um, and then there was a, there was a control condition. Um, what I'm going to talk about are the differences between the ob observation learning in the stroke brain between the right hand and the left hand. So these were interspersed with a rest condition, and then they were flipped. Now, what the individual was told is to observe the action, to pay attention to the action, because they would be performing these actions outside the scanner with the same hand that the performer was using. The other thing I need to tell you is that all of these individuals had left hemisphere damage. So we picked the stroke subjects. We only picked people with left hemisphere damage and therefore right uh, hemiparesis. And all of them, their right hand was their dominant hand. So we really stacked the deck uh, in, in terms of this to not deal with this perhaps asymmetry issue on this first go around. So when they were watching the uh, actor perform with the right hand, they would be imagining doing this action with their paretic hand. Okay, And everything that I'm going to tell you from this point on, you have to remember that. I will remind you, though. Um, she had two subgroups, uh, one with, uh, with internal capsule lesions, as identified here, and one with cortical plus internal capsule lesions. And you can see that on the bottom plot, um, the lesions are obviously bigger uh, because these people have both cortical and subcortical. Um, the data I'm going to show you are collapsed across the two lesion groups. There were some interesting differences between the two groups. I don't have time to go into that. We can talk about that afterwards. But uh, if you just look at the two, at the two groups together, um, so this is the main effect of action observation. And what you need to know is that the stroke subjects are represented in red. The non-disabled are represented in blue. And the overlap is purple. So let me take you through this. So this is right-hand action observation on the top. And remember, for the stroke individuals, this would be their paretic side. Um, and what you see is there's an asymmetry here in terms of just if you just look at the overlap. So the comparison between stroke and non-disabled, there's more purple on the left brain here than there is over here. So the health, the non-disabled group has more of a bilateral representation to action observation of the right limb than the stroke group does. The stroke, stroke group seems to be biased toward the lesioned hemisphere. When you look at left-hand op action observation, uh, we see more of a symmetrical representation here in both groups. So the overlap is, is much more the same. Does everybody see that? Is it is counterintuitive, which is why it's, I think, extremely interesting. I love counterintuitive findings. <laughs> So let me talk a little bit more about this asymmetry that we see. Um, uh, so if you look at laterality of brain activity during action observation, so laterality being if it's a positive number, then it is uh, skewed toward the left hemisphere. And if it's a negative, uh, it's skewed toward the right hemisphere. So laterality would be how even is the representation in the two hemispheres. And uh, here we've got a few uh, important areas. So this is uh, inferior frontal gyrus opicularis, um, par pars opicularis. So she separated the IFG into two putative areas where she actually did see some differences. And this is the IFG triangularis. This is pre-central uh, gyrus. So this is you know, motor, essentially motor cortex. Uh, and this is, um, this is SMG. So what you can see, you can see again this asymmetry between the non-disabled and the disabled with in pretty much all of these areas. Um, you would expect this. So this is 
uh, for right-hand observation uh, is the dark bars, and for left-hand observation is the gray bars. So here again, for right-hand observation, you see that the stroke group is showing a uh, left bias laterality uh, in IFG OP, IFG T. This is, of course, expected, uh, and in uh, SMG. The non-disabled group um, uh, shows what we essentially saw on the other uh, on the other figure, only now you're seeing it in terms of laterality. So there, it, it doesn't seem to matter whether they're doing left-hand observation or right-hand observation. They're getting a somewhat greater bias uh, toward the right hemisphere. But it's not very large, as you can see. And then finally, if you take brain activity during right-hand versus left-hand action observation, and you do that comparison, in the stroke group, right hand greater than left hand is in red. Left hand greater than right hand is in purple. And if you look at the non-disabled group, right hand greater than left hand is in blue. So you again see this different pattern. Uh, and left hand greater than right hand is in teal. So you can see that the stroke group has a different pattern of activation comparing right-hand observation to left-hand observation. Now, how does this relate to the uh, motor control or action outside the scanner? And that's what this graph essentially shows. And that is that the re this is the relation between brain activity during action observation and motor capability to perform the same actions. So in left IFG pars opicularis, this is the log mean right hand movement time. Longer movement time is more severe or worse performance. And that is correlated positively with the co contrast value for this uh, ROI, such that higher activity, higher contrast, is related to longer movement times in IFG. And you see the same pattern in IFG triangularis. You see a reverse here, but it's, uh, it means the same thing for the FAS score, which is the functional ability score from the wolf for performing these same actions that they observed, such that a lower FAS score is more impaired, less normal, is related to a higher contrast. So if this pans out, what this essentially means is that action observation could be a putative means of activating the lesioned hemisphere of invoking activity, particularly in these nodes of the mirror neuron system. So we think this is very promising, but we don't want to go much further until we've done the other work, we've done the other side, and we've probed this a little bit more. And that's essentially what's going on uh, in, in, our, in our labs. Uh, Katie has, is going off to do a postdoc uh, in uh, Brower's lab at Yale uh, looking at uh, issues related to meditation uh, and mindfulness, which is been a passion of hers for a long time, but she's going to stay involved with us and our continued research uh, in this area. So I'm going to take a few minutes and talk about this last area, and that is this issue of the stroke disability lends itself to questions related to choice of limb use. So there's been a lot of work looking at the performance of the impaired limb, but very little looking at how the stroke individual makes a choice about which limb to use in the real world. And all we know is that they don't use the impaired limb all that much, but what goes into making that choice? So in collaboration again with Nicholas Schweighofer, uh, one of my uh, former graduate students who just finished actually and is back in Taiwan, uh, did this work. We developed a paradigm whereby we could get a quantitative measure of limb use under two conditions, either a forced choice limb, uh, so targets appear from, 
projected on one target at a time is projected onto this workspace. And all the subject has to do is move to the target and back. And so it's a reaching task. It's not a grasping task. But we have two conditions. One is a force is a free arm condition task where they can use either limb to, to move to the target. If you and I were to do that, most of the targets on this side, we use our right hand. Most of the targets on this side, we use our left hand. And middle targets, we would sort of be 50-50 with a, as we moved, uh, a little bit to the left, we'd probably use our right hand more than our left hand, our dominant hand. So the sort of the halfway point is actually tilted a little bit to the left. So we know what, what normal people do. And we ask, we put them in a free choice condition, our individuals with stroke, and we then put them in a forced choice condition where we say, we ask them to move to all these targets with their impaired limb to look at their performance and also what they choose to to do. And so we have a, essentially a way of comparing uh, what they do in the free condition, which is really reflecting what their normal choice is, and what they do in the force condition. Um, what I wanted to say about this is that, so what I've plotted here, this is actually using Excite data. This is spontaneous arm use as, as uh, acquired through the motor activity log, which is a structured interview which we don't think is a real good measure of what people do because it uh, relies on your memory. So you ask somebody, how frequently did you use your right hand to open a drawer? You know, you don't, I don't pay attention to what hand I'm using when I'm moving around in the real world. And so we think this is not a great measure. It has been used. It's, uh, it's one of the few measures out there, and so we think our BART system is perhaps a better way to measure this. And we're uh, just about ready to publish a paper describing the whole BART system and how we measure learn non-use with it. But if you plot the MAL data, five being that they use the limb uh, as well as normal, zero being they hardly use the limb, if, or they use it, don't use it at all for that activity, if you plot that, those data, along with the Fugelmeyer score, what you see is, particularly if you look up here at people that have very high Fugelmeyer scores, you know, above 50, which is quite good, so they have very little impairment, look at the spread that they have in their spontaneous use. So this person uh, has high capability and is using their limb quite well. But this person, who has the exact same Fugelmeyer score, is hardly using that limb at all. So there's something else going on here besides motor capability. We immediately think, you know, that, oh, well, it's because they, you know, have some impairment. But what we're illustrating here is there's got to be something else uh, going on. And so what we're beginning to look at is the, uh, this notion of self-efficacy. So how confident am I that I can accomplish this task with my paretic limb? And this may not be uh, affected by motor impairment at all. It's simply my experience living with this limb that doesn't work very well. And I may not be updating my self-efficacy, particularly if I don't have good experience using this limb. So uh, the, the definition, as Bandura uh, refers to it, is one's perceived confidence about his or her ability to attain a specified level or type of performance in a given environment. Self-efficacy is task-specific in nature. So it's not like a trait. In other words, if I have self-efficacy for rock climbing, I might not have self-efficacy for skateboarding. So it's very ta task-specific. And we know that self-efficacy is positively correlated with motivation for specific tasks. Um, and there has been a little work done associating functional recovery after stroke with measures of self-efficacy, particularly in balance, falling, and lower limb function. But there's essentially been nothing done uh, on the role of self-efficacy regaining upper limb function after stroke. Um, so this was Xu Ya's dissertation work. She modified our bilateral arm reaching test. Uh, so she reduced the number of targets, modified it, and she developed a measure of, rel of a relative score instead of a raw score of self-efficacy. And I'll show you how she did that. So the instructions were, 
These were for hand target combinations. And essentially, the subject started at the start position. And then they received uh, two targets on the screen. And uh, they were labeled with specific hands to reach those targets. And they were asked, without moving, which target did you feel more confident in reaching quickly and accurately using the indicated hand? Mind you, this is without moving. So this is getting somebody's perceived level. And they would then uh, respond either with a circle or a square, depending upon which one. We tried to make this unbiased. So they just had to respond by giving us the symbol that was above the one that they were more confident in. And uh, that is moved, but that should be over the square. We had two hands, I'm sorry you can't read, two hands, nine competing targets times uh, 10 targets for basically 180 trials. And this was her measure then of relative self-efficacy using these target hand combinations, which was the number of hand target combination responses divided by the total number of hand target combinations uh, presented. And so we had a scale of never confident, sometimes confident, to always confident. So between 0 and 1, essentially. And here's what the data that we found for control subjects. These are age match controls. And here, what we've done is we've just shown you the mirror image for the target. So uh, 0 is right in front of you. And then 45 degrees would be over here, uh, 135 and 180. And what you see is, the, uh, for controls, the, uh, so you can see we have a scale of 0 to 1 here. So never confident is lower. Always confident is higher for all the different targets. And what you can see is a very nice relationship. The top two uh, graphs are the near targets. So people are more confident in reaching near targets. And, they're, and that confidence goes down the further you are away from the midline. And that's true on both sides. Uh, and they are most confident with their dominant limb reaching near, which is the pink. The blue is the non-dominant limb reaching, uh, which is blue. And then these are the far targets. And they're essentially similar. So you're less confident, even healthy controls, uh, reaching uh, to these um, to the far targets with the dominant limb, and you're the least confident uh, in reaching to the, with the non-dominant limb. Uh, and you really suffer down here. Uh, and remind you, this, this comes when you do this comparison. So it's a relative comparison, which actually makes the measure much more sensitive. Now here's what we find in stroke subjects. A very similar pattern, only now, here, instead of plotting dominant versus non-dominant, the pink is the non-paretic limb, and the, and the blue is the paretic limb. They have a similar kind of trajectory. They're least confident when the targets are farther and uh, farther away from the midline and, uh, and when they're using the paretic limb. So we think that this, uh, this measure uh, is a valid measure of their self-efficacy for these reaching tasks. We did see a difference between people with right paresis versus left paresis. But I caution you, the N is pretty low. But you can see uh, that people with right paresis, uh, which would be the dominant limb, uh, these uh, two graphs are very close together. Whereas here, you can see there's quite a big difference uh, in the, in the uh, paretic and non-paretic limb. We're pursuing that because uh, the n is somewhat small. So our hypothesis was if there's a relationship, if self-efficacy of the paretic arm reaching can be used to predict hand choice, decision making, essentially, for reaching movements, there should be a significant correlation between reaching self-efficacy with this new measure and the probability of paretic arm selection for reaching in the free condition. So can I predict how somebody will, uh, will reach, use their paretic limb in the free choice condition if I uh, know what their relative self-efficacy is? So she did uh, this, essentially tested this, uh, this prediction, this hypothesis. 
Uh, and now we had people actually reaching. So once you see a target, move to the target as quickly and as accurately as possible with whichever hand you wish to use. So this was the free condition. And it looked essentially like this. We gave them feedback if they got it, one out of one, two out of two. Here they missed it, so they got two out of three. So we just gave them feedback about their accuracy. There were 10 targets, 10 repetitions, 100 trials in the free condition. Uh, and this is how we calculated the probability of hand selection, basically the number of hand selections uh, over the total number of hand reaches. And again, we're between a scale of 0 and 1. And this is really uh, very promising results. So what you've, we've got plotted on the uh, y-axis is the probability of the paretic for the stroke group limb choice as a function of the relative self-efficacy for the paretic limb. And then we're comparing this with controls. So I bring your attention to the red uh, symbols, which are the stroke group, where people with low relative self-efficacy for this reaching task have a very low probability of selecting that limb. People with a higher, uh, with a higher self-efficacy uh, have a higher probability of selecting that limb. It was highly significant in the stroke group and not significant at all in the healthy control group because they're choosing the limbs pretty much 50-50 like you and I would. John. Well, Shirley, the, I, the trouble I always have in thinking about self-efficacy is when is it actually a separate construct and was it, where, when is it just my accurate self-appraisal of my performance capability? So, have you tried predicting their hand use from, let's say, their RT when they're forced to choose, and does that do worse than self-efficacy? Right. So they're in the forced condition, you are, um, you have a real confound there because there's no choice. So the decision to use the limb is gone. No, but I guess uh, maybe I misinterpreted well, your question. What I'm imagining is that I let's say I choose which limb to use based on which limb performs the best. Okay. Then self-efficacy is just me telling you right. what right. I know about. So, so, so what you're saying is if we looked at performance, right. if, you we... said, uh, if you forced them to pick each target with both hands so you know, let's say, the relative RT difference right. or something. So it looks very similar to what I showed you, the MAL and the FIM. So in other words, performance right. doesn't seem to relate. So it doesn't predict no. which, the choice. Okay, no. that, that's helpful. Now, we, we, uh, and I'm saying we've done that informally. Uh, but we have the data, we have the trajectory data, we can easily do that. I mean, I but it's a good question. Or you could even do a regression model where you put in performance and then say, does self-efficacy add to Yes, yes. Performance. And that's, that's what I wanted her to do. The, the N of 15, you know, we, we, we have 15 right now. So there's a lot that we can do with this. And we're very excited by this, actually, because we think it is getting a little more at the mechanisms, perhaps, of learned non-use that have been kind of fuzzy up to this point. So that's it. I have a great, great group of collaborators, former students, current collaborators, uh, doctoral students, postdocs, and my funding. And I want to thank you for your attention. And I apologize for going over. <laughs>